Hello guys and welcome back to my channel. In this video, we will be learning about the wrist joint. To begin with, the wrist joint is a synovial joint of ellipsoid variety that is formed between the lower end of the radius and the articular disc of the inferior radio ulna joint proximally and three lateral bones of the proximal row of the carpal bones that is the scaphoid, lunate and the triquetral distally. Now as you can see here, this is the left hand complex, this is the left radius and the left ulna. The wrist joint is formed by the lower end of the radius and the proximal row of carpal bones that is the scaphoid, the lunate and the triquetral bone. Moving on to the articular surfaces of the wrist joint, the upper articular surface is formed by the inferior surface of the lower end of the radius and the articular disc of the inferior radio ulna joint that I had shown you earlier. Before I tell you about the lower articular surfaces of the wrist joint, let me briefly tell you about the carpal bones. From the radial to the ulna side, we have the scaphoid bone right here the lunate bone, the triquetral bone and the pisiform bone. Then again from the radial to the ulna side, on the distal carpal, distal row of carpal bones, we have the trapezium, the trapezoid, the capitate which is the largest of the carpal bones and the hamate bone right here. Out of these carpal bones, the lower articular surfaces of the wrist joint includes the scaphoid bone the lunate bone and the triquetral. Now looking at the important points, the wrist joint is a synovial joint of ellipsoid variety between the lower end of the radius and the articular disc of the inferior radial ulna joint proximally and three lateral bones of the proximal row of carpals that is the scaphoid, lunate and triquetral distally. The articular surfaces. The upper articular surface includes the inferior surface of the lower end of the radius and the articular disc of the inferior radial ulna joint, while the lower articular surface includes the scaphoid bone, lunate bone and the triquetral bones. Moving on to the ligaments of the wrist joint, firstly we have the articular capsule. The articular capsule surrounds the joint. It is attached above to the lower ends of the radius and the ulna. It is attached below to the proximal row of the carpal bones. This is the articular capsule of the wrist joint. A protrusion of the synovial membrane, which is called the recessus saxiformis that you see right here, lies in front of the styloid process of the ulna bone and in front of the articular disc right here. It is bounded inferiorly by a small meniscus that projects inwards from the ulna collateral ligament between the styloid process of the ulna and the triquetral bone. Moving on to the next ligaments, we have two palma carpal ligaments. Now this is a diagram of the anterior or the palma view of the right hand. First let us look at the palma radiocarpal ligament. The palma radiocarpal ligament is a broad band that begins from the anterior margin of the lower end of the radius bone right here and its styloid process. It runs downwards and medially and is attached below to the anterior surface of the scaphoid bone, the lunate bone and the triquetrum bone right here. This is the palma radiocarpal ligament. Secondly, we have the palma ulnocarpal ligament. The palma ulnocarpal ligament begins from the base of the styloid process right here and runs downwards and laterally and is attached to the lunate and triquetral bones. This is the palma ulnocarpal ligament. Now looking at the dorsal aspect, there is one dorsal radiocarpal ligament. The dorsal radiocarpal ligament is weaker than the palma ligaments. It begins above from the posterior margin of the lower end of the radius right here and it runs downwards and medially and is attached below to the dorsal surfaces of the scaphoid, lunate and triquetrum bones. 
this is the dorsal radiocarpal ligament. Moving on to the last two ligaments, we have the radial collateral ligament and the ulna collateral ligament. The radial collateral ligament extends from the tip of the styloid process of the radius to the lateral side of the scaphoid bone. Whereas the ulnar collateral ligament begins from the tip of the styloid process of the ulna right here and extends to the triquetral and pisiform bones. Concising the important points under ligaments, firstly we have the articular capsule that surrounds the joint. It is attached above to the lower ends of the radius and the ulna. It is attached below to the proximal row of carpal bones. A protrusion of the synovial membrane called the recessus saxiformis lies in the front of the styloid process of the ulna and in front of the articular disc. It is bounded inferiorly by a small meniscus projecting inwards from the ulna collateral ligament between the styloid process and the triquetral bone. The fibrous capsule is strengthened by the following ligaments. Next, we will move on to the palmar aspect. There are two palmar carpal ligaments. First is the palmar radiocarpal ligament. It is a broad band. It begins above from the anterior margin of the lower end of the radius and its styloid process. It runs downwards and medially and is attached below to the anterior surface of the scaphoid, lunate and triquetral bones. The palmar ulnocarpal ligament is a rounded fasciculus. It begins above from the base of the styloid process of the ulna. It runs downwards and laterally and is attached to the lunate and triquetral bones. Both palmar carpal ligaments are considered to be intracapsular. On the dorsal aspect, there is one dorsal radiocarpal ligament. The dorsal radiocarpal ligament is weaker than the palmar ligaments. It begins above from the posterior margin of the lower end of the radius, runs downwards and medially and is attached below to the dorsal surfaces of scaphoid, lunate and triquetral bones. The last two ligaments are the radial collateral ligament and the ulna collateral ligament. The radial collateral ligament extends from the tip of the styloid process of the radius to the lateral side of the scaphoid bone. The ulna collateral ligament extends from the tip of the styloid process of the ulna to the triquetral and pisiform bones. Nextly, moving on to the relations of the wrist joint. Anteriorly, the wrist joint is related to the long flexor tendons, as you can see right here, along with their synovial sheaths and the median nerve. Posteriorly, the wrist joint is related to the extensor tendons of the wrist and fingers along with their synovial sheaths. Laterally, the wrist joint is related to the radial artery. Moving on to the blood supply, the wrist joint is supplied by the posterior and anterior carpal arches. Now since this is a palmar view, here you can see the deep palmar arterial arch and the superficial palmar arterial arch. This is the dorsal view and you can see the arterial dorsal carpal arch. Moving on to the nerve supply of the wrist joint, it is supplied by the anterior interosseous nerve and the posterior interosseous nerve. The anterior interosseous nerve is a branch of the median nerve. This is the posterior interosseous nerve on the posterior aspect of the arm. Now looking at the important points in the relations blood supply and nerve supply. In the relations of the wrist joint anteriorly, it is related to the long flexor tendons with their synovial sheaths and median nerve. Posteriorly, it is related to the extensor tendons of the wrist and fingers with their synovial sheaths. And laterally, it is related to the radial artery. The blood supply to the wrist joint is by the anterior and posterior carpal arches and nerve supply is by the anterior and posterior interosseous nerves. Nextly, moving on to the movements of the wrist joint, we have mainly five movements. First is the flexion movement, second is the extension movement, third is radial deviation, fourth is ulnar deviation and fifth is circumduction. Firstly, the flexion movement occurs more at the mid carpal joint than at the wrist joint. This is the lateral superficial view of the right upper limb. Now, the main flexor muscles are the flexor carpi radialis that you see right here, the flexor carpi ulnaris and the palmaris longus. These three muscles are the main flexors of the wrist. Next is the extension movement which takes place mainly at the wrist joint. 
The main extensors of the wrist are the extensor carpi radialis brevis that you see right here, the extensor carpi radialis longus and the extensor carpi ulnaris right here. Next is the abduction movement that is radial deviation towards the radial side that occurs mainly at the mid carpal joint. The abduction movement that is radial deviation is brought about by flexor carpi radialis that I had shown you earlier, the extensor carpi radialis longus and the extensor carpi radialis brevis which I had shown you earlier as well and the abductor pollicis longus right here and the extensor pollicis brevis. The adduction movement that is ulna deviation towards the ulna side is brought about mainly by the flexor carpi ulnaris and the extensor carpi ulnaris muscles. Finally, in circumduction movement, the range of flexion is more than that of extension. Similarly, the range of adduction is greater than that of abduction due to shorter styloid process of the ulna. Now, let us look at the important points in detail. The wrist joint has the following movements. First is flexion. It takes place more at the mid corporal joint than at the wrist joint. The main flexors are flexor carpi radialis, flexor carpi ulnaris and palmaris longus. The extension movement takes place mainly at the wrist joint. The main extensors are extensor carpi radialis longus, extensor carpi radialis brevis and extensor carpi ulnaris. The abduction movement that is radial deviation occurs mainly at the mid carpal joint. The main abductors are flexor carpi radialis, extensor carpi radialis longus and extensor carpi radialis brevis and the abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. The adduction movement that is ulna deviation is occurs mainly at the wrist joint. The main adductors are flexor carpi ulnaris and extensor carpi ulnaris. Finally, in circumduction movement, the range of flexion is more than that of extension. Similarly, the range of adduction is greater than that of abduction due to the shorter styloid process of the ulna. Finally, looking at the clinical anatomy, the wrist joint and interphalangeal joints are commonly involved in rheumatoid arthritis. The back of the wrist is the common site for a ganglion. It is a cystic swelling resulting from mucoid degeneration of synovial sheets around the tendons. The joint is immobilized in optimum position of 30 degrees dorsiflexion that is extension. The wrist joint can be aspirated from the posterior surface between the tendons of the extensor pollicis longus and extensor digitorum. I hope you found this video helpful. To get the notes on wrist joint as well as notes on other subjects of anatomy, physiology, psychology, pathology and biomechanics, visit my Instagram page, the link to which is given in the description below. To get updates on my latest videos, click on the subscribe button. To get notifications, tap on the bell icon. Thank you for watching.